Okay. Good. So uh, we talked about, we introduced vectors or vector spaces as a concept to describe uh, geometry for graphics. And we also started introducing some arithmetics with it. We introduced, most importantly, addition and scalar multiplication because that allows us to create any random vector that we want in our 2D or 3D space. Um, so that is basically all we need. But of course, it is very helpful to have uh, other arithmetics as well if we want to achieve certain things. Uh, so for example, we could think about, can we also multiply vectors? Um, and... Uh, but unfortunately, there is no straightforward definition of multiplication of vectors. Of course, we could use the same way as we defined subtraction and uh, addition to define multiplication by just multiplying the single individual uh, coefficients of a vector with each other. But it would kind of not make sense because there is neither uh, a geometric interpretation of it that kind of is intuitive or makes sense or is useful in any way. And also it's uh, from the arithmetics, there is nothing that we gain from it. We get another vector with uh, values, but they have no characteristic that is of any use for us. But there are different ways to define multiplications in relation to vectors that are very useful in graphics. And we've already seen one, which was of course the scalar multiplication, but that was not the multiplication multiplication of vectors, it was a multiplication of a single value with a vector. And now we're talking about the multiplication of two vectors. And in graphics, there are two important, or in, in uh, algebra, there are two important multiplications of vectors that are very useful in graphics, which is one is the dot product and the other is the cross product. So let's start with the dot product, or it's also called the inner product. It is also called the scalar product, although I would not like to use that term because it is too confusing with the scalar multiplication, which is something different, because the dot product takes two vectors and multiplies them with each other, multiplies them with each other and produces a scalar value. And that's where the name scalar product comes from because the output is a scalar value, but the input are two vectors, whereas the scalar multiplication, the input is a vector and a scalar and the output is a vector. Very common multiple choice question in exams, by the way. Good, uh, yeah, so the scale, the dot product is defined, uh, or the inner product is defined as the multiplication of two co corresponding coefficients of a vector of two vectors with each other and then just the sum over all those products so for a 3d vector you have v1 times v w1 plus v2 times w2 plus v3 times w3 and then you see you get a scalar a single a one particular single value and uh, one of the reasons why this dot product is so interesting is that there is a relation between the dot product and the angle between the two vectors, which is here denoted as theta, as the angle between the two vectors. Um, actually, in the book, they do it the other way around. They use this characteristic to define the dot product and then show that it has this arithmetic characteristic that I use to define dot product. You could also use the arithmetic uh, uh, thing to define the, uh, the ar arithmetic specification to define a, a dot product and then show that the uh, that uh, it fulfills this characteristic, which is, uh, I think, the more intuitive way, which is why I'm doing it this way around. And uh, the characteristic says that the cosine between uh, of the angle between the two vectors is the same as the dot product divided by the multiplication of the length of the two vectors. Now, if you think about, if you remember from school, uh, I hope I'm not starting, starting to bore you again, uh, the cosine function, cosine of an angle theta is defined um, by this function here, which starts at one and then goes down to zero and then up again to one goes down to till minus one and uh, crosses zero at 90 degree. Here we have 180 degree and here we have 270 degree and here we have 360 degree and then it continues again in the same shape. So this is the angle theta and uh, that is the relation. Also the, the theta here in our case is the angle between the two vectors v and w. And then 
if we calculate the cosine of this angle we have, it is related to the value of the scalar product or the other way around, we can draw conclusions about how the scalar product looks like if we look at the angle or if we have a scalar product with a certain characteristic, we can draw conclusions about the angle. So for example, what can we say if the scalar product is zero? If we look at the formula, if we can just rewrite, rewrite that to say the scalar product of two vectors, or then we get the scalar product of two vectors is the length of one vector multiplied the length of the other vector multiplied the cosine of the angle theta between the two vectors and that means uh, if the vector the the angle is zero uh, no if the scalar product is zero then the angle must be 90 degree or 270 degree which means the angle between the two vectors must be either 90 degree uh, the, the, it's 90 degree or 270 degree which is here which is also a right angle so we see the two vectors are perpendicular to each other if the scalar product is zero or the other way around if we have uh, perpendicular ve ve uh, vectors then we know that the scalar product is zero similarly we know that the scalar product is at a maximum when the angles are 180 degree or 360 degree which means they are pointing either in the same direction or in exactly the opposite direction. And if they are unit vectors, that means the length is 1, then we, uh, we know that the maximum of the scalar product is also 1. And if it is 1, then we have this uh, option that they are pointing in a different direction. So just a few more uh, characteristics of a uh, vector product. Uh, Vector product, what is the vector product of, uh, oh, vector product, the dot, sorry, the dot product, the inner product of a unit vector with itself? One, uh, yeah, one, exactly, because we see here inner vector with itself, that means the, the angle is zero, so the cosine is one, and unit vector, that means also the length of the vector is 1. So based on the formula, we immediately know that the scalar product is 1. We don't have to calculate it, but we just see it from, from the formula. And uh, the second question I already answered. What do we know if the vector product, uh, if the dot product, sorry, if the dot product of two vectors is 0, we know they have a right angle. Uh, they are per perpendicular to each other because the angle must be 90 degrees or 270 degrees. Good. Ah, or... There is, of course, a third version, third option. Exactly, one of them is a null vector. Good. So uh, another thing we can use the, the dot product for is to calculate the length of the projection of one vector onto another. This uh, is like just uh, might seem not very interesting now, but you will have an example later when we do the light calculation where you will see where this is useful. So if this is the one vector w, this is the vector v, then this is the projection of one vector of the vector v onto the pro uh, vector w. So this is the projection p. So it's a scalar value because it describes the length, not the, the vector there. And this is, we can... Uh, see that from uh, again from this uh, this formula that I had here this one here at the top if we uh, take that well, let's just write it down here v times this dot product of v with w is the length of the vector v times the length of the vector w times the cosine between uh, of the angle between the two. Now we know from trigonometry that the cosine, so in the image the cosine is, uh, the, the theta is, something is wrong today. The, uh, 
the theta is, is here. And we know from trigonometry that the cosine of theta is also defined as in a triangle as this one side here, which is on the ankle versus the side on the opposite, the, the length of the side on the opposite of the right angle, which is in this case, of course, the length of the vector. And if we put this in here, then we see that we can calculate the length of this pro the projection by just doing some arithmetic. So we don't have to actually calculate the, the angle or the cosine, but we can just do, use uh, some simple arithmetics here to get this projection. Like I said, Right now it's an interesting observation, but uh, or it's an observation. It might become more interesting when you use it actually in graphics. So uh, what we see here that we can use the scalar product for all kinds of things to do certain arithmetic that will be helpful in certain situations. And most importantly, because we have this uh, interesting relation with the cosine, the scalar product is often used every time you do something with angles. Um, now, every time you do something with uh, vectors, another uh, form of multiplication is very important and that's the so-called cross product of two vectors which is uh, from the notation the dot product is often uh, written as as a dot that's because of the name and the cross product often we use in a notation across and the definition of this is just uh, multiplying uh, uh, the, the coefficients in a way that looks a little strange. There is an easy way to remember that. I can, can post that in the tutorials. Uh, you reminded me of that. Um, but um, it, it looks a little weird, but the interesting thing is, of course, when we do this, we have certain, the result has a certain characteristic, which is very important. And we see also that the result of this cross product is not a scalar, but it is another vector. So we're multiplying two vectors with each other and create a new vector. And that vector has certain characteristics that are quite useful and quite important in graphics. It also has a relation which is related to an angle, which in this case is the sine of the angle between two, uh, between these uh, two vectors. Um, it is similar than this, uh, it looks similar than this, this cosine relation, but in this case it is not used to define it. It is just a characteristic which in some situations is quite uh, handy, but is not, has, not as important or as relevant as the cosine relation that we have for the dot product. More important here are other characteristics, which uh, is exactly this here, which is that the cross product is of the re the vector that we get from the cross product is orthogonal, so it has a right angle to both original vectors. And uh, now uh, I was too fast. I already turned the slide uh, because I wanted to ask you what would be, how would you try to prove that? Uh, now you already see it, uh, the first sentence. Remember the scalar product, we said one of the more uh, important, most important characteristics is that if we have an angle of 90 degree, uh, the cosine is zero, and since the scalar product depends on the cosine, also the scalar product is zero. So if we can show that the scalar product of these two vectors is zero, we have proven that they are orthogonal to each other. And this is an example, and the reason why I'm uh, last year I was also writing it down, um, but because the writing is very annoying and people start talking when it takes too long, uh, I, I usually made it then shorter. This is why I printed it this time to, so you have it on the paper because also I want you to have an illustration for the for the exercise that you're doing because there will be a lot of uh, these kind of uh, proofs there. And a lot of people always, when they see or have to make a mathematical proof, they think it's very complicated. But you see here, it is very simple. We want to, what we want to prove here is we want to show that they are orthogonal to each other. And we know that we can show that by just saying, showing that the uh, scalar product is zero. So we just take the scale, take the vectors, write the coefficients down and then do the simple arithmetics that result from doing this scalar multiplication. And then we see here the, uh, so the first thing is just the coefficients from the first vector. And then we create the cross product, which you see, uh, as you see here is defined like this. So this is basically just writing the definition down. And then we do the simple, uh, in the next step, we calculate the dot product. 
which is just multiplying the first coefficient here with the first coefficient here and then the second with the second and the third with the third and then adding them up and then we end up here and if you write it in a clever way like I did here that they are these two are on top of each other which is uh, not only for formatting reasons here but also to show very easily that this here equals each other out so that is zero that is zero and that is zero of course we have different values here but these are just scalars that we multiply with each other and we know that scalar multiplication is commutative so we can reorder them and then you see because we always have plus and minus they equal each other out so we have proven that this is zero and this is you see a really simple proof and a lot of uh, exercises are like this so this is why I, I printed it down but this is also why I didn't do the second one because it's really that simple so you can do it as an exercise and I highly recommend to do it also as an exercise there are a lot of things here that I'm not doing where I'm writing down exercise where even if they're not at the tutorials but I really recommend that you do that I'm saying this and also I'm making a lot of things a little more detailed this year with the mathematics because we had a change last year in the curriculum that this course you used to that used to be a second year course is now a first year course and um, also um, there used to be a mathematics course another mathematics course which was now cancelled and last year we realized that there were a lot of people in the course having really problems with the really basic arithmetics and not necessarily problems with understanding them but with really problems doing them when we graded the exams we saw that there are a lot of people who have really problems just doing the calculations which is why I'm kind of well, maybe overdoing it a little bit here um, but I'm just trying to uh, to reach the, the, the best possible level here um, so one of the things you should get out of this is really it's important to not only just sit here and look at it and say okay I understand that but also practice it because understanding it when someone tells it you and then doing it later and doing the actual calculations in the exam those are two different things and the other thing is of course uh, it is also difficult for me because I'm, I kind of have to play around a little bit to hit the right level to not be too simple and not be too too difficult so if you have the impression I'm too simple or too low or if I'm too advanced for you let me know then uh, I'm, I'm very happy to to get the feedback and I'm rather have the feedback now than at the end because now I can still react to it if you write in the evaluation that's also nice but then only the people next year will benefit from it good so uh, yeah so um, Cross product, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, sorry, I forgot to say that a cross product is defined only in 3D. Yeah, and then it's clear, right? Uh, sorry, I, that was my mistake. I forgot that. I'm a little confused today. I think that's because of this stupid board. So if you're in 3D and you have two vectors, then the third one points in the other direction. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. No, you put in two 3D vectors. That's... Uh, that's exactly why this thing here looks so strange because uh, that's just the characteristic of it it's just defined that way that the resulting vector looks is exactly orthogonal and that's uh, you don't see it immediately but it's also like intuitively from the geometry how would you say does a vector look like when I see two vectors you cannot immediately see from the coordinates from the vector how a vector would look like uh, an orthogonal vector would look like in 3D and that's why it looks kind of weird here but we have proven that there are indeed orthogonal 
Yes, and we come to that soon. <laughs> At the end of that slide, actually. It's not a question? No? All right, good. Yeah, so uh, being orthogonal is a very important characteristic, but uh, of course, I already said that unit vectors have a very important role and are very handy very often. So uh, having two orthogonal unit vectors is, of course, a very uh, interesting and important uh, case. First of all, of course, if we, uh, if we multiply them, we get another vector which is orthogonal to them, like I've already drawn here. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now one question is, of course, what is the length of that vector? Of course, we would assume it might also be a unit vector, and indeed it is a unit vector, because, uh, and here this uh, sign relation comes in quite handy, because if you, I have to draw again, if you look at the sine function, sine theta sine is defined like the cosine, only it starts at a different position. So it is, here we have 180 degree, here it's uh, 90 degree and so on. And so you see the sine of uh, 90 degree is one. The length of the original vectors is also one. So the length of this resulting vector is also, of the cross product vector is also one. So we also get a unit vector that is orthogonal to the other vectors. But as you already said, when I draw it like this, why did I draw it like this and not like that? Which of the two vectors do I get? And both? No, you don't get both. Uh, uh, the answer to this is it depends on in which order you multiply them. You will see that. I think that is also, an, yeah, it's also an exercise on the, on the tutorials. Uh, in the tutorials, you're supposed to prove that this here is, is the same as this year. And that means, of course, in one case, the po vector points up. In the other case, it points directly in the opposite direction. And that depends on the order in which you multiply it. So that means also that cross product is not commutative, which is important because normally multiplication is commutative. But if you do it with two vectors with the cross product, it is not. Good. So that answers the question. All right, a few more uh, characteristics we can think about, something interesting. What is, uh, if we multiply a vector with itself, what do we get? Null vector, exactly. And how did you see that? Oh. Okay, yeah, perfect. So you used the uh, second uh, issue that I have here on the slides to prove it. Because of this formula, we see that the sign is zero. Uh, the, the angle is zero, that means the sinus is zero, the sine is zero, that means also we get the null vector. And the same, of course, if they are parallel, because they are pointing in the same direction, then of course the angle is zero, again, sine is zero, we get the null vector. Another way to prove this would have been to do it arithmetically, to just uh, do, write it down, to do the calculation. So for the first coordinate, for example, if we take the definition of the cross product, we get these uh, two coordinates, uh, these, we, we get the, this, uh, uh, the sum here of these two coordinates, which is zero, of course, and for the second and the third coordinate, it's the same, so we get another vector. Same case in the second situation, we have then, if the second vector is, uh, uh, if the vectors are parallel, then this one vector is a scalar multiple of the other one. So we basically get the same, the coordinate is basically just, the, it has the same coordinates multiplied with lambda. And if we enter this in a formula, we get zero for the first coordinate here and also for the second and the third one. So we get again, the null vector. So again, this is a lot like simple repetition, but I also put this down as examples because uh, you will get a lot of these uh, exercises in the tutorials. Good, um, yeah, so this is basically the most basic general uh, uh, stuff we have. So I hope it's getting a, a little more interesting now because uh, the vector arithmetic is of course a very powerful tool to describe 3D graphics. So the interesting question is now how can we describe 
really objects with this and we'll start with very simple objects because I said we will only do very simple uh, modeling here. We will not do modeling here in the course, but we will describe very simple geometric shapes like lines and circles. And there are different ways to uh, uh, different representations that we use in mathematics or in graphics to describe different objects and the reason for for using different representations is of course each representation has a certain characteristic or certain advantages that come in quite handy in certain situations and you will see later sometimes I will use one representation over another one because you can just do the calculation very easy with it or can just understand it intuitively better. Good. Um, yeah, and we've already seen examples for different representations. For example, with the scalar product in one situation, I was using the formula with the angle because that was more intuitive. In other situations, you use the arithmetic because that is more intuitive. Good. Um, yeah, so let's start with a very uh, generic way and with the first way of representing objects, which is a uh, uh, so-called implicit representation. And this is just uh, a, f uh, a general description about how we implicitly, how we how we intuitively can describe or formally describe an implicit curve. So a curve we can see uh, intuitively basically as a line that is drawn uh, without lifting the pen. So like here uh, a closed line or I can also draw an open line but it's basically everything I draw between setting the pen down and then releasing the pen. And that, if we think about how can we describe this mathematically, because of course this is not a function that we can describe from x to y, because we can have the same y value for the sim same uh, for the, for a single x value. No, we can have different y values for a single x or the same x value, but we can describe this by using a function that goes from 2D to 1D. So from we use two coordinates to map it to a third one and if we would draw that for example we get something like this that we have a plane here and then we get a val for each x y value in that plane we get a set or f x y value and then we say we only look at the values where this function is zero so we basically cut through this valley or mountains that we get here or it's like uh, if you look at it think of it uh, like a landscape then it's the sea level and then this intersection here is our curve and if we do that we can in theory model any kind of curve by just defining the function in an appropriate way. Um, <clears throat> of course the, the, uh, the, the difficult way is of course uh, finding a function which is also why we're only dealing with uh, very simple geometric shapes but then you'll see that this uh, is actually not that difficult or pretty straightforward in that case. And this is called implicit because uh, you cannot use it to directly calculate the values, but you can only get them indirectly by solving the equation. So the values are not explicitly there, but you cannot explicitly get them, but you, they are kind of implicitly encoded in this equation. So every time you have a function that equals zero, usually is an implicit representation of a geometric shape. And this is the general case, so let's look at a more concrete example, which is a circle. And uh, that might not look uh, very intuitive or, or straightforward. If you look at it, if you see a circle in 2D around, well, around the origin, is defined as the first coordinate uh, to the power of 2 plus the second one minus the radius both to the power of 2 equals 0. So that is an implicit uh, uh, representation of it. Uh, it's an implicit equation. The question is, does it really represent a circle? And if you think about what we learned today with the vector uh, calculation, then you will see that this is actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy to understand. Because if you look at a vector, again, I was not consistent here. Um, if you look at the vector p, that is, or a random vector p that is on the circle, then the length of this vector p must of course be the same as the radius of the circle. So if we write this down with how we defined the length of a vector here, 
you see if we do a simple arithmetic transformation here we end up getting exactly the same as here so this is really because we said this is p is a random vector so a random point on a circle we can use this equation to describe any random point on the circle an alternative way to see this would have been to just use uh, Pythagoras because you uh, if you have for example a vector p here then you know this is the x and this is the y coordinate and if this is the radius and then you write and you have a right angle here and you write down Pythagoras you get exactly this equation here if you just do a simple arithmetic transformation like I did at the bottom. Good, so that is pretty straightforward. The question now is of course how can we represent a circle that is not around the origin uh, and that is also pretty, pretty simple. Um, from a geometric point of view it is easy to to see um, if you think about uh, what I said here um, if a, a, a point, and here it's important again to remember that P and C are not locations but they are vectors so we can say if a point is on the circle around or a vector is on a circle around the center C exactly if and only if P minus this circle is on a similar on the same circle around the origin so if we take this circle and move it to here with the vector C in this direction then we can say the point P is on the circle directly when it is the vector P minus C is on a circle around the origin and if we put P minus C into that equation we get then exactly this uh, relation here and proving this arithmetically is again part of the tutorials. Good, so we can represent uh, circles now in this implicit rep uh, representation and uh, the next uh, straightforward or simple geometric shape is a line. Implicit representation of a line, I'm pretty sure that most of you are familiar with the so-called slope intercept form. Maybe you heard it with a different name, but uh, that is pretty much what you usually are taught in high school. If you want to describe a line in a 2D coordinate system, what you do is you describe the, uh, the slope of it by taking this side here and dividing it. So, if, for example, if this is 1 and this is 2, then the slope A is one and a half and then you take uh, and that would be then a line that goes through the origin but if you want to move it up here then you have to add of course a distance here which is C to each value and that is this here and this is this uh, intercept here so if in the image it would be one half X plus two equals Y would be the formula to describe this line Pretty sure you're familiar with this. Uh, also, I see uh, starting to get loud again, so I'm starting to bore you, so I have to make faster. And uh, it's pretty straightforward how to create the, the implicit representation of it. Just bring it to the other side, and then you have it equal to zero. Or if we write it down in a more general way, we have the implicit representation of a line defined as some parameters uh, times x plus another parameter times y plus c equals zero. Good. And um, If that uh, intersects with the origin, we can also represent this in vectors. And again, this is an example for we basically just use a different representation to talk about the very same thing. But we'll see later how why this representation comes in quite handy in certain situations. And um, so uh, you, you see this here by just doing the, the scalar product uh, here. So if the vector n is minus a1, and the vector p is x y then if we do the scalar product we get a x minus a x plus y uh, equals zero which is exactly here this uh, slope intercept form or the implicit representation uh, if uh, it goes through the origin so if c is zero of course we do not only want to have it uh, with c is zero but also with uh, with uh, random values and then uh, with we also want to have lines that do not go through the origin but through any uh, position through our space 
and then we just have to subtract this value here. It's basically similar to the situation that we had with the circle that uh, where we said when we move the circle, when we want to have a circle that is not around the origin, we can create that by taking a circle around the origin and just translating it in a direction of the vector of the center of the of the uh, of the of the circle. And in this case, this would then be just here the vector that puts it down, or if we create it the other way, the vector that puts it up here. And this is this vector P0, so this is a vector that points to the line, and then we have this vector N, which uh, specifies the orientation of the line, and this is uh, something you already see here. I have this blue vector here in the image, and it turns out that this blue vector is actually this vector N, because this vector N is perpendicular to the line and that is a very interesting and important characteristic of this kind of representation. That's exactly the reasons why we use this presentation very often, although it doesn't look as intuitive or as straightforward as the other presentation probably, but uh, it has this characteristic that it is perpendicular to the line and uh, so we have here an angle of uh, 90 degree and we can prove that. Again, remember we uh, we uh, when we have a right angle, doing a proof with that often involves the scalar product because we know that the scalar product of two vectors with the right angle is zero. So uh, in this case, what we could do, we can say the implicit representation of the line is in a general way, it's a x plus b y plus c equals zero. And then we pick two random points on the line, P1 and P0, uh, P, P1 and P2. And then we know if those two points are on the line, then the vector P2 minus P1 must of course also be, must be on the line. Those are vectors pointing to points on the line, but the vector P2 minus P1 is then this vector here that you get here. So this is P, uh, P1 minus P2, that's this vector here. No, P2 minus P1 I was writing. Yeah, again, I'm sorry for this horrible writing here. I don't, I'll try to fix it till next time. If not, I'm switching to the board or something. We'll see. Um, yeah, so uh, <coughs> this vector must be on the line, and then we can prove that this vector n is perpendicular to the line by just multiplying it with that vector, which the scalar product, because we, we know then if the vector is perpendicular, the scalar product must be zero. And if we do that, it's just, again, simple, straightforward writing it down, but only there is here, there is a little trick involved. So we, uh, we have here the scalar product of these two vectors, then we write it down here, which is, this is just writing down the first coordinate and then the, doing the scalar product with the first coordinate of this vector here. And then we're just uh, doing the multiplication here. And then you see here, this is the trick. I just added this plus C and minus C here. C is just a constant value. So the equation doesn't change by adding and subtracting the very same thing that doesn't change the value of the equation. So I can just write this down here. But of course, if I write it down here, and if I choose the value C as here, then you see here, for example, this here, and this here is exactly the linear equation for this point P2, which was defined as being on the line and if it's on the line, it must fulfill this implicit equation, which means that this here is zero. In the same way, this other here is zero. So we have proven that this vector is perpendicular to the line. And since we have chosen random vectors for P1 and P2, we have chosen that for any vector, this is perpendicular. Good. And the reason why they are so important is, uh, or they, these vectors are very important, which is why they have a particular name. They are called normal vectors. So if a vector is perpendicular to a line or another vector, it is called a normal vector with reference to that line. Or in a general, more general way, if a vector is uh, perpendicular to the tangent plane of a surface, so the tangent plane is, I'm 
going to skip the mathematical definition of it, but it's basically if you have a, a, like a circular f a surface or a sphere, then the tangent is basically the plane that just touches the sphere at this particular point. And then if you create an, a vector that is in a right angle to that plane, you call this a normal vector or a surface normal. And these vectors are very important in graphics. And uh, if that comes as a surprise to you, let me remind you that uh, you should start very early with the practicals, because if that's a surprise you, you haven't made it to chapter 7 now. Um, yeah. Good. So that finished the uh, implicit representation of basic geometric shapes, which is a line and a normal vector in 2D. Next week we will move then to 3D, but before that we will also talk about uh, parametric representation. But I will uh, skip that for today and uh, finish it up next week because we're already running out of time and I think there was already a lot of uh, material today. Good. So uh, see you again next week. <laughs>